Okay, members are ready to resume the sitting. Mr. Jacqueline Magalier has given notice of an urgent oral question to the Minister for of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. I would remind members that if they wish to ask a supplementary question, they should raise continually in their places. The member who tabled the question will be called automatically to ask a supplementary. Clerk, please read the question. To ask the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs to set out the legal basis for his unilateral decision to halt the construction of port inspection facilities required by the withdrawal agreement. And I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. On, on Friday, uh, I instructed officials to halt work relating to the programme for permanent builds at the ports, as well as work on OCR charging. This was done on the basis of DERA having been appointed by the Executive to lead on these matters. There are a, no there are a number of reasonable arguments for taking this uh, approach. Uh, firstly, there is uh, a lack of clarity on a range of legal issues which need resolved in respect of the implementation um, of the protocol and indeed the functioning of the internal UK single market. I am also concerned that uh, we do not have the required uh, certainty to forward plan, uh, given a number of factors outside of the control of my uh, department. These include the role of the ongoing uh, discussions, including those at Joint Committee, and the lack of certainty that this presents, the uncertainty around grace periods, and the undeliverable and unworkable requirements for retail uh, consignments if a solution is not uh, achieved. I have also taken uh, the decision uh, in regards to OCR charges, uh, in particular because of my concerns in relation to Section 46 of the Internal uh, Market Act and the requirements that that places uh, upon me. But does the Minister accept that the vast majority of people will see this as another DUP stunt, only a very dangerous stunt that will serve the purpose of inflaming tension within loyalism, and unfortunately from the past we know where that can lead us to? Well, my concern, um, Mr Speaker, is for the people of Northern Ireland, and uh, my concern is, is about public money uh, being spent, and my concern is making sure that we have what we need uh, in place um, so that we can serve um, the constituents here uh, that we all uh, represent. Uh, I think because of all of the uncertainty that we have uh, in regards to the legal position and because of the, of the practical barriers uh, that we also have at this time, that it was entirely proportionate uh, and reasonable uh, to take uh, this approach. And I would hope that people would put their views uh, on, on, on Brexit uh, to a side uh, for, for the moment and see what is actually best uh, for the people that we represent. Nicole William Irwin. Mr Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister, given the lack of certainty because of ongoing discussions of the Joint Committee and the lack of ratified EU-UK trade deal by the EU Parliament and the uncertainty as to the future of the current grace period, how can your department plan with any certainty for infrastructure and recruitment of staff? Well, I think that that is the difficulty that we are presented with now, and, and as I have said, is, is one of the reasons why uh, I, I had uh, um, uh, instructed uh, my officials uh, to, to, to put a halt uh, to that work. Um, there are uh, an awful lot of things that are outstanding here at this moment in time, uh, and my question to others uh, would be is how would you propose uh, that we uh, continue uh, when we don't have that certainty. Um, I, I hope there is a recognition uh, that we need changes. Um, uh, I hope there is a recognition of the damage that the protocol is doing. I think that is very, very clear to, to most of us, and certainly uh, in my role, I see the impacts that, that it has had. Uh, so how on earth are we to, to plan uh, for the future when there are so many uncertainties uh, at this moment in time? And that's why I think uh, it was a very reasonable to, step to take uh, on Friday. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Minister, if this was a reasonable step to take, can I ask why you did it late on a Friday afternoon? Can I ask why no official statement has been issued by your department? Can I further ask specifically whether a ministerial direction was sought or issued and whether this order is live in that is your permanent secretary seeking 
uh, further legal advice on whether he should proceed with your instruction or not? Uh, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I can um, confirm that I had given an instruction uh, to officials, and I, I have had this raised now a number of times. The timing of this announcement, as if it is somehow uh, inappropriate to do things at certain times uh, of the day or certain days uh, of the week, uh, that is not the case. It is something that I have been looking at. It is um, following the concerns that have been raised uh, with me. And uh, I don't think it's uh, uh, unreasonable in any way uh, for me to want to, to make sure that appropriate action is taken, um, considering the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Nicole McNesbitt. Um, the Minister will be aware that Europe thinks we have got, in Northern Ireland, the best of both worlds. Uh, would the Minister agree with me? It would be an act of great friendship and neighbourliness uh, to lobby to extend that to our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we could then return to the trading arrangements in the UK and between the UK and Ireland that applied last year and a decade ago. And then the checks would not be at our ports and airports uh, over goods that may or may not end up in the EU, but at Dublin's, or sorry, the Republic's ports and airports over goods that are definitely heading to continental Europe. Uh, and therefore, uh, the EU would take back control of their inspections. Um, we would solve all unionist objections, and the Republic would benefit. So it would be a win, win, win. Well, I think that the member highlights um, a very important uh, point, uh, which is that the checks that are currently taking place uh, are taking place in, in such a way uh, that causes friction between one part of the United Kingdom to another part of the United Kingdom. And this is one of my great frustrations with what is taking place uh, right now, is that there could be goods that are coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland that are at no risk whatsoever of entering the EU uh, single market, uh, and yet there is still that fettering of trade uh, that is taking place. Uh, the member uh, mentions um, uh, some solutions, uh, as, as he would say them, and I think that we need to have a greater discussion uh, around potential uh, solutions and potential alternatives, because that has been shouted down at every opportunity uh, by others. Uh, people have um, stuck to the protocol thinking that it is um, the solution uh, to the problems that we face. It is not. It is adding to the problems uh, that we face. And I think that it would be um, good if everyone right around this chamber could acknowledge that, that problems exist and actually recognise that the protocol in Article 14 uh, allows for us to find alternatives. Um, the protocol does not have to be set in stone forever. Uh, it does not always have to be there. So let's recognise the problems that are there, not pretend that they don't exist, and actually find uh, alternative solutions to the issues that we're facing. I call John Blair. Again, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister what discussions or consultations took place between himself and uh, the business or sector representative groups relating directly to, to the decision he took uh, in relation to the, the ceasing of the construction of necessary infrastructure ports and whether he believes he has any support whatsoever from those sectors uh, in the decision he took? Well, I can certainly um, express to uh, the member that I have had a number uh, of representations from, from businesses, both as, as, a, as a constituency member and, and as also uh, with, with other businesses that are um, uh, operating in Northern Ireland that have come to, to see me or, or, or have corresponded with me because of the um, number of problems that they are facing as a result uh, of the protocol. And in fact, um, members from this side uh, of the House have got in contact with me as well and have uh, expressed to me the problems that they are facing and that companies in their constituencies are facing as well. And I think it's, it's, it's disappointing uh, that other members across this House refuse to even recognise uh, that problems exist and that we need an alternative uh, to what is going on uh, right now. I have had so many representations, so many people uh, are concerned about what we are facing uh, right now and are very fearful about what comes after uh, the 1st of April. And that's why I think we all need to work together uh, to, to find solutions. I call Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and Speaker, I just want to go back to a quote given by the First Minister just a few weeks ago on the Andrew Marr show when she described Brexit with the protocol in place as a gateway of opportunity for Northern Ireland and the whole of the United Kingdom and asked the Minister what's changed 
because it's not Brexit nor the protocol in those few short weeks that has led him to take such, uh, such action and whether he believes that the actions and decisions he took on Friday were cross-cutting across the executive departments. Thank you. So unfortunately, uh, Mr Speaker, we're in the position here where we're not able uh, to enjoy um, the benefits of Brexit to the extent, same extent that other people in the rest of the UK are, uh, because we are now uh, facing um, the problem and the growing problem of being cut off from our biggest market, where we do so much of our trade from. And I know people don't like hearing that, uh, but it is the case that we do more trade with GB than, where, uh, with, with any, than with anywhere else. Uh, and so that's a reality uh, that we need to face up to. And it is not simply the case that the protocol needs to be tweaked uh, or, or changed um, in, in some meaningless way. Uh, we need fundamental uh, change, and in, in my opinion, we need the protocol uh, uh, to go. Um, I was, uh, my department was given responsibility uh, for this area. Uh, because of the uncertainty that we face coming towards the end of the grace periods, uh, I think this is a, a proportionate and responsible uh, step to take um, because we need that further clarity, and that's not what we have right now. I call Jim Allister. I welcome the Minister's move. I trust it was based on a principle of opposition to the protocol and therefore will be carried through with other actions to unstitch the protocol. But could I ask the Minister, has he heard any suggestion from those who demand rigorous implementation how within the protocol he could meet his statutory obligations under Section 46 of the UK Internal Market to facilitate the free flow of goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland and to strengthen the smooth operation of the internal market. How could that be done within the protocol? And could he explain to the House what it means to have stalled the charges and what benefit that will bring to business? So, Mr. Speaker, no, I haven't heard anything uh, from any other side of the House uh, in regards to how I can. Um, uh, make sure that I'm uh, fulfilling my duties in Section 46 of the Internal Market Act. As the member will know, that places on me a, a duty to have a special regard for three things. First of all, Northern Ireland's place within the internal market of the United Kingdom. Uh, secondly, Northern Ireland's place within the Customs Union of the United Kingdom. And thirdly, as he pointed out, to facilitate that free flow of goods between Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. That is a legal duty uh, that is upon me. Uh, I have to have special regard. And in the House of Commons, when Minister Walker uh, was, um, uh, as the government minister introducing this, said um, that it is fundamental. Uh, that's what special regard means. It, it's absolutely fundamental. Uh, so it is right uh, that I do all that I can uh, to make sure uh, that I have that, that, that special uh, regard and take on board the concerns that, that are being expressed, which is one of the reasons why um, it is uh, appropriate to have halted the work on OCR charging, because I can think of, of nothing more um, that would fetter the free flow of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland than charging people uh, to uh, bring, bring their products and goods into Northern Ireland. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the, the, the Minister has mentioned charging there. Would the, would the Minister outline his views on what impact SPS charging would have on business and consumers here in Northern Ireland if left as is? Yes, um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it would have a significant impact here uh, on businesses uh, in Northern Ireland because every time things are, and goods are brought in uh, to Northern Ireland from Great, Brit Great Britain, and remember, um, that is our largest market, and we do a huge volume of trade uh, between Great Britain and uh, Northern Ireland. Um, it, it, of course, will have a, a significant uh, impact, and every time something is brought over, every time those ports are used, it is additional cost for business, it is additional cost for consumers. And the other outworking of that, of course, is that we could end up in the position, and this was highlighted in one of our local papers last week, where I think it was 64 per cent of retailers in GB are now reconsidering whether or not they want to continue to bring items from Great Britain uh, into Northern Ireland. That could then very heavily uh, impact on, uh, on trade uh, here and um, put a further burden uh, on costs and on consumer uh, choice. And uh, in that regard, I need to make sure that I'm fulfilling my duties under Section 46 of the uh, Internal Market Act, uh, and that will require uh, very close consideration uh, of these matters. 
Mayor Philip McGuigan, the call Philip McGuigan. Gary Melgood, John Collier, uh, Minister, leaving aside the issue of the legality of the decision and uh, leaving aside the fact that this decision and the way it was made without discussion with your executive colleagues has added further unnecessary worry and uncertainty on retail business and trade here in the North who want to see the protocol work. Uh, you will be aware, Minister, that my uh, party colleague in Midden East Antrim Council, Ian Ferrari, was visited yesterday by the PSNA, who told him of a threat to his life after uh, disgraceful sectarian graffiti appeared in the, uh, a hall village, linking him to the Irish Protocol. So, Minister, can I ask you uh, if you bear any responsibility in terms of your decision, previous decisions made by your predecessor, other decisions made in unionist-dominated councils, and public utterances and comments made by unionist politicians, you, that you, if you bear any responsibility in the heightened attention which has seen a rise in uh, threats to uh, elected representatives in recent days and weeks? Well, first of all, let me just say, uh, Mr. Speaker, that no matter um, uh, who you are, whether you're in public life or, or not, it is absolutely wrong for people to be targeted uh, in this way because of their views, uh, because of what they uh, may have said. Uh, I think that that is uh, completely wrong, and I have no problem in, in wholeheartedly uh, uh, condemning that as, as someone um, that has um, faced uh, in the last number of days and weeks. Um, concerning actions taking place at my office and um, uh, the, the type of um, correspondence that we can sometimes get into our, our inboxes, uh, I have no hesitation whatsoever uh, in condemning uh, any such uh, behaviour. But I fail to see how what I have done on Friday could have any way have contributed to that. What I'm saying is that we're facing a time of uncertainty. We don't know what is going to be expected of us. We don't know what's going to be required of us in terms of um, what needs to, to take place uh, at the ports. So I have decided um, uh, to, to, to get that to, to stop. And uh, I don't quite see how those two things uh, can be linked. But let's be under no doubt whatsoever. This is a time. Of, of heightened tensions, particularly uh, in, the, in the unionist uh, community. I recognise that and I see that, and that's why I think we should all want to try and work together to find uh, those solutions that actually work uh, for people in Northern Ireland and don't cut us off constitutionally and economically from the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank the Minister for his response. Um, can the Minister advise he will be aware of contractual uh, liabilities and commitments in regard to this project and indeed others? Um, can the Minister advise and clarify us, has the project now been cancelled or has it been delayed and has he taken any advice around the legal or financial liabilities associated with either cancellation or delay in the project because there is a contract and the Department is contractually bound to that contract? Well, at this stage, um, Mr. Speaker, what I have sought to do uh, is get further clarity. Um, we don't know what is going to be expected of us, or we don't know uh, what is going to be required. But what I am um, very sure that I want to do is to, is, is to make sure um, that we are keeping value for money and the public purse uh, at the top of the agenda, and making sure that we can do uh, everything we can to protect the public purse. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you. Um, Minister, you spoke about the uncertainty in forward planning. What uh, comfort can you give? Uh, we're coming into a busy time of the year for moving, moving of agricultural stock back and forth between GB and GB into Northern Ireland. Can you give us reassurance that, this, that there will be no hold-ups in relation to that? Uh, well, um, Mr. <coughs> Uh, speaker, I want to, to thank the, the member for, for her work on this, and she has uh, raised this with me uh, before. It is a concern because of the outworkings of the protocol, of the impacts that this will have on the movement of, of livestock, and uh, those consequences are, are, are far-reaching. That's why I think we need to find a better solution uh, than what we have here at the minute, and I'll certainly uh, do all that I can uh, to push the EU and the UK um, so that we find ourselves in a better position than we currently are. Nicole Stewart-Dixon. 
Uh, Minister, business thrives on certainty, uh, and you told this House a few moments ago that you had had uh, discussions with various businesses and business organisations. Can you name for us, Minister, those business organisations in Northern Ireland that told you that the best course of action you could take would be to stop the building and to stop the recruitment of employees? Well, um, Mr Speaker, I've had a number of conversations with various um, businesses and, of course, it would be inappropriate uh, for me to, uh, to name at this stage without their permission um, who, who, who I have met with. Um, but I am um, I'm, I'm convinced that this was, the, this was the right course of action uh, for me uh, to take because the member is absolutely right at what he said at the start. Um, that businesses want certainty, and that's and that and that's something uh, that we don't have uh, at the minute. Look, Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Dixon might not like uh, the answers that I have given, uh, but this, but this, but this, these are the actions uh, that I have taken, um, because I believe this is in the best interests uh, of Northern Ireland to get the certainty that we required. And here's part of the problem, Mr. Speaker, because we have protocol zealots who want the rigorous implementation of the protocol at all costs. It doesn't matter if there's an alternative that's better for Northern Ireland. It doesn't matter if we can find an easier uh, way of doing things that impact less on the people of Northern Ireland. Their concern is for the protocol and the protocol alone. Call Harry Harvey. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, would the Minister outline what role his department has in ensuring the free flow of goods between GB and NI. Uh, I thank the, uh, the the member for his his question, and I think I would refer back to the uh, previous answer that I gave to to Mr. Allister. There is under the Internal Market uh, Act, Section 46, which is a requirement uh, on me to have that special regard um, f uh, for Northern Ireland's place within the internal market. Uh, within the customs union, and of course to facilitate uh, that trade between Great Britain uh, and Northern Ireland. So that is a responsibility that is on me. However, it's not only a responsibility uh, that is on me, Mr. Speaker. It's also a responsibility on the other devolved administrations, on ministers uh, in, in in Scotland, on ministers in Wales, and indeed. Um, all UK government ministers, and I have been in correspondence um, with uh, George Eustace and my counterparts in uh, Wales and Scotland, asking them what action they are taking to ensure that they fulfil their obligations under Section 46 uh, of the uh, Internal Market Act. However, I think that there is also a responsibility, uh, not just on um, not just on on us within the UK, but the EU and the UK in the protocol have said um, that um, the measures that they take should impact upon the lives of people in Northern Ireland as little as possible. And that's why I think that it is so important that um, they take action, seeing the consequences, seeing the outworkings of the protocol, that they take actions uh, to make sure that we can have that free and unfettered uh, uh, trade. And if there is a diversion of trade, um, that is a problem, and it shows uh, that the protocol is not working because, of, of course, diversion of trade uh, is a reason under Article 16 uh, for, um, the, for, for unilateral action to be taken. I call Justin McNulty. Graham Thank the Minister for his coming to the House today and for his answers thus far. Like others in this House and in the community we all represent, I express my frustration around the stunt taken by the Minister on Friday evening. I'm not sure who you took your legal advice from. Was it Sammy, Arlene, Jacob or Gregory? It is a smokescreen. It's a farce. You didn't halt any building, as building has not commenced. You've not halted the protocol, as there is recognition for both the UK and the EU the protocol is going nowhere. Will the Minister acknowledge the harm and confusion he has caused? Will he agree with me that this is a Brexit protocol and is a direct consequence of Brexit? Will the Minister acknowledge that the only thing that he has stopped is the publication of his executive's plan for the opening up of the economy, for the returning of life to some sort of normality in the weeks and months ahead? No, Mr Speaker, I wouldn't agree with any of the points uh, that the member has made. And I, I think um, in this country all too often uh, we can get ourselves head up and um, get wound up uh, very quickly. 
No action that I have taken on Friday has in any way held up or contributed to a slowing down uh, of, the, uh, of the pathway to recovery uh, a document. Um, as I have said a number of times now, the steps that I have taken are a result of the uh, practical barriers and the legal uncertainties uh, that currently uh, exist. Uh, I think the steps that I have taken have been entirely uh, reasonable, and I would ask people uh, whether their opposition to what I have done uh, is, is, is based um, on, on common sense and, and practicality, or is it just based on opposite, opposition to anything um, that they don't like in relation to Brexit and the protocol? I call Roy Beggs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Northern Ireland Protocol is disrupted trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Does the Minister uh, agree with me that it is much better if we can remove the protocol or at the very least install SBS agreements which would remove much of that friction? And is he curious why some who claim to want such changes are insistent on building uh, structures which may not be needed? Well, I thank the, the member for his question. I do agree. Uh, I think the protocol is completely unworkable. I think it's contradictory, and I don't think it sets out to do what those who drafted it intended for it uh, to do. Uh, and that's why I think that it, that it needs to go. And of course, the, the, the members hit the nail on the head. Um, we want to see that that free flow, that ease of trade, as much as we can between. Um, different parts of the United Kingdom, and certainly I'd be interested to explore um, possibilities around, uh, around agreements that would uh, limit uh, the amount of friction uh, that, that may exist. And that's why I think it's entirely uh, sensible um, that as those issues are being discussed, as the Joint Committee has said they're going to, to meet again to discuss some of these issues, uh, that it's only right um, that, we, that we wait and, and we see what comes out uh, of um, discussions rather than um, uh, do work which then might never, never be needed to require. And that concludes this item of business. Thank you all. Members, please take a raise for a moment or two.